Hello and welcome to Spooning with me, Mark Wogan. I'm here in the Mount Street restaurant in London's Mayfair. Yes, the lap of luxury. And as ever, I am joined by a very special guest and I will be feeding them food that they say they love and food that they say they potentially hate. But they will be eating these things blindfolded. Yes, we'll be challenging expectations. Now, this week's guest, well, he's a dancer, he's an author, he's also a soldier, he's got a very hard shell, but you know, maybe there's a little fear bubble inside waiting to burst, but he is here to talk about his fantastic new book. Will you please welcome today's guest, Ant Middleton. Thank you, Mark. You're a gentleman. Dancer at the beginning is very interesting because it's almost flipped on its head now. You know, normally it's soldier, adventurer, hard man, and it's just to start with dancer, dancer. mate. Listen, I, I like well, it. I like it. Well, for those people who don't know, you've literally just done the Australian version of Strictly, basically, yeah, it's isn't it? Dancing with the Stars. So uh, I suppose you're right. Yeah, I am mm. now. Would until you? I do something else, I'm a dancer. That's. But it does still require you to lead, which you're quite familiar with yes. doing. Did you find it difficult taking that kind of instruction? Because you're used to handing out the instructions. Yes. Um, I had a, uh, a Russian dancer as well, so she was quite vocal, quite, you know, hands-on. Um, but then I just thought, you know what, I'm getting a taste of my own medicine. <laughs> I can't really say anything. I've got, I obviously done it on purpose, but um, there was a few times where, yes, I just had to stop the steam from coming out my ears and just bite my tongue. Um, it worked. Now, there's obviously in this country, we've got the curse of Strictly, which is people seem to go on it and either run away with a dancer or it appears now get bullied by a dancer mm. and have a terrible time. Does the Australian one have the same sort of reputation for that happening? Yeah, I got bullied and I ran away with my dancer. My wife doesn't know it yet. <laughs> okay. But, um, you know, we keep that one under the radar. Um, okay. no, <laughs> no. We're, we're not going to tell anyone. Don't worry. <laughs> no, no, nobody's listening or watching this. Do you know what? It was, um, no, it was a great, great experience. And, uh, you know, I go into things quite focused, you know, I'd say hyper focused where I just focus on my dancer, what she's teaching me, and I focus on my routine. Mm. So outside of that is very much like we'd go in four to six hours a day, Monday to Saturday, just smash it out. As soon as it's done, it's like, right, I'll see you tomorrow. But unlike a lot of the contestants, you go in already super fit. Mm, yeah. So you're able to kind of do that four or five hours. Mm and probably retain a level of focus and concentration that other contestants couldn't. Absolutely. Did your dancer appreciate that? What, yeah. Sorry, what was this yeah, lady's name? Alexandra. Yeah. Um, oh, yes, she did. She appreciated it because, uh, you know, even as a dancer herself, who's used to these routines, um, what she loved was the commitment that I put in, the hours that I put in, because that's what I needed. I needed to put in the hours. I needed to to go repetition, 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 to mm. get the routine in my head. So it, al it almost became natural on the dance floor so I could then focus on the finer detail, like the posture, you know, the, the, the routine that was needed, um, depending on what dance it was, whether it's the Passe Doble, the Viennese Waltz, all sort of different postures and different techniques. Now, do some of your old special forces mates mm. think it's quite funny to see you in that position? Absolutely, they do, and I, I was absolutely expecting and got untold un amount of uh, grief. But listen, because I'm the hardest out of them all, yeah, you know, they only exactly. took it to a certain level. I might be wearing sequins, what of it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, that kind of repetition and that kind of attention to detail is something that you do focus on a lot in this new book. Absolutely. And before we go into any depth, about your new book, I have uh, an admission to make. And you might not believe this, but my dog ate my homework. I was oh, on... that old excuse. No, no, I used I to was... use that when I was a kid. <laughs> I was on page 30, okay. and Murphy decided he, who is an Irish wolfhound, uh, decided so he wolf. was. Yeah, I live, well, we call, him a, we call him a sharp, tooth, sharp tooth donkey. 
but um, he took it upon himself to uh, eat the book and not not chew it, eat it. So Sharp it's somewhere bonky. in my garden now, Oof. but not in book form anymore. Well, your mission is to pluck it out and no. sort of restructure the book and finish it off. But where I got to was like picking up on that kind of detail and repetition and whatever was that whole section where you talked about when you were going into battle, how important your weapon was to you and how much is this that, that thing where you said I would relax the springs in my ma right. in my magazines. Yeah, it's absolutely. like you're taking the whole thing apart yep. and putting it back together again. Mm -hmm. How many times a day? Multiple times a day. And what I'd do is I'd have everything laid out from my magazines to the springs to the rounds. So as soon as we got the call, it'd be a case that you know I had a technique and we practice just putting everything back together. So it's good to go uh, on the day. And the reason why I relax the springs is because a lot of people don't, they fill it with ammunition. And once the spring is compressed over a certain amount of time, it might not, yeah. Pop. And I couldn't afford to maybe miss out on, on, on firing one round or one bullet but due like to a mistake it. or an attention to detail that I didn't um, put into practice. But I liked that thing and how you related it to the real world with, where that level of preparation enabled you to go into life-threatening situations feeling like you were invincible because it's like everything works so i'm going to be okay yeah yeah you do because you know the preparation's there you know that the training's there you know the almost when you go in that's the <clears> easy part i know that the way that i move the way that i've got my powers uh, to my left and to my right you know my equipment i know where everything is even in the dark we operate at night i can just reach for something reach for a change of magazine reach to put my empty magazine in a pouch mm. so i so i don't lose it you know <clears throat> within seconds so everything is done so i don't have to think about that i don't have to think right if my weapon does jam or if if i do uh you know run out of ammunition what am i going to do you know i don't want to be that burden on the ground but you didn't would it be fair to say you didn't start out as that kind of person? No, of course you won't. No, no, no. <laughs> you start, started out as a as a little sort of uh, you know hyperactive young man that didn't know his ass from his elbow, and just enjoyed the adventure, enjoy, enjoyed the challenge, wanted to be self sufficient, wanted to stand on my own feet. It wasn't really money orientated, so you but know you the little that wage was... that I did get just was sufficient enough for me to do my job. W was that was that attitude from you do you think driven by losing your dad at an early age do you know what yes I suppose a lot of it was because you know when you haven't got a father around at that age you sort of have to figure it out by yourself mm. and because we couldn't speak about my father you know which was strange I mean yeah. I, I read that and I mm -hmm. thought god that's that's a mm. that's a terrible thing to grow up with mm. because your dad passed when you were five six yes, five yeah, yeah. yeah just, and yeah. then your mum got a new partner very quickly yes so and all the pictures removed of dad that's right don't yeah. ever talk about dad. that's it yeah i mean how do, how does that help well it sort of suppressed everything mm. you're forced to suppress everything and you couldn't i couldn't even talk to my brothers because i wouldn't dare whisper his name and potentially be overheard mm. you know because the repercussions were were, were too severe so you just suppress it, suppress it, suppress it to a point where you have to figure it out yourself. You know, having that female, um, my mum in my life was great because I could, you know, I could get, you know, the, the female sort of approach. But to figure out the male side by yourself, and I was a male, mm. it sort of forced me to step up. It forced me to figure things out at a young age. And when I look back three on it, boys, wasn't it? There's four boys. Four boys. Yeah, four, four brothers. Boys, yeah. Without a dad That's and unable it. to talk yeah, about their exactly. dad. Exactly. And I, I assume it affected you all in different ways. 100% it did, yeah. yeah. So my, my eldest, two eldest, it affect them, affected them in such a different way that that came out later on. You know, mm. once we got into our adult ages, into our early 20s, we could start talking about it amongst mm. us. But it's really strange because we, we don't talk about it amongst ourselves even now mm. because it's something that's been so suppressed and so sort of cut out of our lives that you think to yourself, what good is it going to bring? now to to think about it and to bring it all back up and we've all got our own families we all push forward but when i look back on that situation and i always find a, a positive within the negative you know the passing of my father made me self-reflect 
mm. at the age of five. You know, I couldn't go to people. So I used to say, why are you feeling like this? You know, why are you, why are you thinking like this? So I used to break everything down, not overthink, but break everything down to a point where I was self-reflecting from the age of five. But as you went into manhood, you mm. know, you're going through puberty, you're 13 years old, you're full of testosterone and you haven't <laughs> got that kind of guiding thing going, all right, son. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, did you, as they say now, act out? We, I mean, we, yeah. you, you I, I detect reading the research that you were a bit <laughs> of a loon. D- that your dog <laughs> ate. Um, yeah. um, yeah, a bit of a, um, do you know what? It was, it was bizarre because it, it was almost as if I didn't have any limitations. And what I mean by that, no limitations, no boundaries. So what I mean by that is when I'd done something really good, you know, there was no one to celebrate my my victories mm. you know i didn't you know no one say well done son you know it's and when i done something really bad there was no one there to tell me that i've messed up and that this is really bad you know so i didn't know i, I fluctuated between the two levels um, not but really knowing where was, where was your mum in all of this so my mum was uh, obviously she had us four mm. then she had two more children mm. my 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 brother and sister i could still call them a brother and sister so you know us four boys we used to stick together you know, we, we used to just do our own thing. And then obviously mum was so busy with sheltering us, you know, sh- mm. shielding us really. But then dealing with two other children from a man that was, you know, my stepfather, but you know, quite quite an individual to deal with. So she was distracted most of the time and us four boys just used to go off and do do what we wanted to do. We had a very sort of and free life like that. And you also dragged away from everything you knew and, and stuck in a caravan at fr- in That's France right. as well. Yeah, yeah. But you de- developed a love of France as yeah, a result absolutely. of that. And it featured in your, in your novel. That's you know, right. you based it there. Yeah. So <clears throat> you've got all that going on. What or who pointed you towards the armed forces? Myself. I didn't really have an option. I didn't really do well at school. It's a good, um, good person's fault. I know, yeah. So it was one of those. I was never an academic. I, you know, I was always great at sports, always hands-on. And, um, you know, I wanted to get back to the UK. France is great for growing up and growing old, but, you know, especially where I lived, there wasn't much going on, mm. you know. So I just thought to myself, do you know what? One, I can, you know, break away from the family. Two, go back to the UK, which I wanted to do. And three, just challenge myself, have a roof over my head, have a small pay packet, and I can just see how I see how I cope by myself. I've always been self-sufficient, I mm. suppose, for my father's passing. I've had to be. So uh, the moment I could sort of get out and venture into the big wide world, that was my only opportunity and my only chance to do so. And that's why I joined the earliest 16 and 10 months you can join at 16 and nine months as a boy soldier so mm. i joined at the earliest opportunity and you were straight into the parachute regiment that's right the yeah, nine parachute squadron royal engineers nine para- yeah. and, and that's that's tough yeah you know it's, it's you know especially really for a yeah. 16 year old yeah and you know i mean might i be so bold as to say you you're obviously strong but you're not what you would describe as a tall <laughs> I'm person vertically challenged yes, no I, I, I didn't want to you know <laughs> Just, you know, no, I am. I'm, you're a man who I'm, can f- I'm five foot eight. I'm five foot eight short, but five foot eight wide. So, <laughs> <laughs> and when you joined, were you like one of the smallest in it? Yeah, you, absolutely. You know, when I joined, you can imagine. You obviously didn't start out that muscular. No, did you? I was like this. I was nine nine stone wet. You know, I was a runner. I used to run. I used to do you know the mile and a half in seven seven minutes forty. Um, you know, I used to always be in the front when it comes to running. Number one. And it wasn't until, you know, I started putting weight on my back and I really started to develop and, you know, the sort of infantry skills and wanting to, you know, go down that hardcore soldiering route, which was, you know, snipering and, you know, recce troop where you would have to carry your house on your back that I, that I realised that I started, I needed to beef out in order to carry this weight on my back. But you were in the army for four years? Yeah, just under five years, yeah. And then you left? Yeah, I left, yeah. And... But why did you leave? If 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 it had given you so much, what what was the decision behind leaving at that? Point? I was just an individual, you know. I didn't. It's almost that I'd done that, been there and done it, and I get bored very quickly with mm. stuff that I do. You know, once I've achieved and I've, you know, I got best recruit, best PT as a mm. young para. You know, my maroon beret, my parachute wings. I was like, been there, done mm. that. Um, let's do something else. But 
when I left, I loved them. I realized that I loved the military lifestyle, mm. but I just wanted to do something more, I would say more mature, which was then the Royal Marines. So I wanted to, to up my game. I suppose from such a young age, I was so, so mili militrified without even realizing it. Um, the only choice for me was to yeah to go back in, um, but I'd always had that in my mind. When I left, I'd always thought in my mind I'm going to join the Royal Marines, and then you know the Metropolitan Police came up and I went through uh, went through the training all the way to week 15 or 16, you know, and then uh, yeah. So when it when that happened, I was almost like a carefree kid. Mm. I was still young. I was like, if whatever happens, happens. And then so what age were you at then? Twenty. One twenty-two, yeah. and you yeah. got married at that point. That's as right. Well. Yeah, now I got you married when I was twenty. Yeah, yeah. And then you made the <clears throat> extraordinary get married. Mm -hmm. Your lovely wife's pregnant, mm -hmm. and you go and join the Royal Marines. Yes. No. No. This was <laughs> way before. So um, we actually ha got married and had my son when I was still in the army. Right. And and things didn't work out either with her and with the military at that stage so it's just a case of right just cut away cape well if you wish you know right. cut away your parachute and um yes it was uh it's, it's so you think about it i was so young mm. you know so young when i joined the military i was so young when i got married i was so young when i had my first child and you look at kids nowadays and you think how would how how did i cope how did i get through it um but it was one of those that I always had that sense of responsibility when I had my son. Mm. You know, there wasn't a, there wasn't a month that didn't go by that I wouldn't, you know, be there and 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 supply and be there, you know, financially, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I suppose that gave me another kick up the butt to go and go out there and and succeed, mm. in order to make sure that I uh, upheld my responsibilities. Because in the parachute regiment, you did tours of Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Macedonia, yeah, yeah, and then obviously by the time you're then in the Royal Marines, mm -hmm. we're in Afghanistan. That's why, right, yeah. And so that then takes you away from your family mm -hmm. again. Yeah, so it's bizarre because when I left Afghanistan and Iraq hadn't really kicked off, mm. um, but it hadn't at all. Um, and then when I found out that we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, that's when I thought I've got to go back because I wanted to go into combat. I wanted to to experience, you know, that side of things. You know, it's like you're training, 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 training to play in the cup final, for example. That's like that for a soldier, you know. So you train and train and train, playing soldiers, mm. you know, which is all well and good, which I didn't really enjoy. I didn't really get the whole sense of it. To all of a sudden going into combat, it's a completely different ball game. So when Af people said, look, if you join the Marines, you're going straight to Afghanistan. That's what I'm like, it's another tick in the box of me, I'm, I'm joining. Being authentic is really important to you, yeah. right? So I might ask, you appear to be flirting with politics yes. as well, yeah. which, yeah. I mean, as we've all experienced, certainly in this country mm -hmm. in the last couple of years, not a lot of authenticity going on there. What, um, is that something you would aspire to bring? No, it's, uh, when I when I dip my toe into politics, I'm very factual about what I know. Mm. So I'm very factual about security. I'm very factual about safety. I'm very factual about trust and about unity, identity, belonging. So it's even though I step my toe into the political realm, um, I just make sure that I, I I'm the, a subject matter expert of what I'm what I'm delivering mm. um, and what I'm talking about. You know, leave the politics to the politicians. People don't realise, well, they do realise, you know, that the prime minister, the president, they're just a mouthpiece. You know, behind the scenes, they've got their military advisors, they've got their financial, they've got their, you know, there's so many things that are going on behind the scenes that they all just be, get shoved up to the to the to the man in the chair or the woman in 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 the, in the hot seat, and they blurt it out. So if I can help with one element of that, whether it's defense, whether it's, you know, whatever it may be, um, and I can bring what I know factually to the game. Um, so once you bring something factually, the problem's right there to be solved. So, so, th so there's no truth in the rumor that you're gonna run for uh, Keir Starmer's seat when he steps down? <laughs> well, no, I would not say, I'm not saying at that point, but I would definitely, um, I would definitely not, you wouldn't be surprised if, you know, during the next elections, 
or the ones after that I'm I'm not dipping my toe a bit more seriously into mm, into the political realm, into the political uh, sort of arena, because I feel like the country's pulling me back for for a reason, and um, you know I've got such a authentic and cult following mm. here in the UK, um, and you know if I can be a voice for the, the silent majority mm. because of the narrative that's being forced down. Um, and I can push would, that aside. What would you say? How how would you describe who is who is the embodiment of the silent majority? Because we hear that a lot, and yeah. people will go, "Well, I don't feel heard. Mm. Am I the silent majority?" Mm. I mean, I think lots of people don't feel yeah. heard, regardless of whether their leanings are left, right, centrist, whatever it is. Mm. In your mind, who are the silent anyone majority? that doesn't sit on the left? Right. It's obvious. It's, okay. it's it's not it's not it's not that unobvious. You know, people. Yeah. I'm like people. I'm like, can you not see it? Are you you know? And then you've got your people that wanna that don't that see it or refuse to see it. And it's like you know, the left narrative is being pushed. Of course mm. it is. You know, but um, and anyone that doesn't sit on that on that side automatically sits on the extreme opposite side. Mm. You know, and the narrative is very 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 clear. It's obvious. But where before, what I loved about politics, where before you'd you know. You'd have your left and you'd have your right and you'd have the circles and then you'd have the coming together of the left and right. You'd have mm. this segment here and you go, and that's what people normally, you know, mm. sway towards. And they might sway a little bit here, but now it's so diverse. Well, it's, I think it's so directed that if you're not, if one side of the part voice isn't being heard, um, is being heard, then the other side isn't. And it's not a case of where does the other side fit? It's like one sits here and one sits here. This mm. is so divided nowadays. That it's very, it's very, uh, it's very clear on who the silent majority is, depending on where the narrative is going. Because I mean, historically, as a country, we always have flourished in a slightly left of centre yeah. position. Yeah. But obviously, where where you're following is is a bit more right. Mm, I say centre right. Yeah. Yeah. But it is that thing. Well, now. I say that centre right, but it's. You know, I get where I get the left. I, I'm, all, I'm all for inclusivity. I'm mm. all for um, diversity. Um, if you pe speak to people that, that know me who who do sit on the opposite side of what people think that I sit on, you know, I treat people for who they are. Well, I'm I think given your ca career, you've yep. you know, and the situations that your career, when in the military, mm. put you in, you have to take each individual on face value. Yeah, you can't Absolutely. judge anybody from where they come from or what their mm. beliefs are is mm. well i actually talk about that in the book <coughs> military yeah. mindset i talk about you know respect mm. i talk about respecting individuals respecting you know as long as their their narrative isn't isn't forced which is more of a distraction mm. to what what the goals need to be and what the direction that we need to head in then you know respect is absolutely key in any, in any military mindset, you know, military mindset, I talk about respect is uh, is absolutely key. So it's one of those where, unfortunately, because of the division, you either sit on one side or the, or the other. But I'm I'm pretty central. I'm mm. pretty I'm pretty factual. I'm pretty, uh, you know, I, I say things how they are. But people don't like to hear the truth nowadays, <laughs> right? It's like it's it's really really bizarre because you people say ah, you're brutally honest, and I'm like that's doesn't that word doesn't really exist you know i'm not brutally honest i'm just honest now so what, you, what does brutally honest mean it's so like, you yeah. would say you don't set out to hurt anybody or hurt anybody's feelings or no that's down to the individual if they're yeah. if they're offended if they're you know that's mm. not my problem mm. um it's like with me when people say you know people have on the flip side people have the the right to 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 say things about me and my, their opinions about me and i'm like that's your opinion that's great mm. i don't get offended by it Mm. You know, that's your that's your opinion. That's, you, everyone's entitled. The moment you take away opinions, but you know people's beliefs, people's values, and then you've got you know, you've got a one one minded sort of forced um, mindset into being told how to act and how to think, even though it goes against all your morals, morals and, and values. Then you, you've just got a carcass that's just being manipulated. That's what makes the world go around. I love how how different people are i love the different cultures i love the different ways and that people operate and function i love the, you know that's why i travel so much mm. you know and uh, it's well, because given that you now work 
pretty mm. exclusively in Australia. There's quite yeah. a lot of travel for you. Yeah, and you, you've got a new show coming out in Australia where <laughs> you climbed K2. That's and there's right, a documentary yeah. around yeah. that coming out, yeah. and you've got the book out at That's the right. same time. Now, the, going back to the book, f 52 yep. different sort of modules or, or approaches. Lessons. Lessons. Yeah. A lesson a week. For the now, whole year. Why 52? 50. Are you bringing out a set of playing cards to go with this book? No, it's 52 weeks in a year, right? Of course. So there, there you, you go. go. Come on, there mate. Listen, I do think about these yeah. things. Um, <laughs> so it's, do you know what? Like all my books, um, you pick this book up, it's on the side of your bed table, mm -hmm. you pick it up before you go to work or whatever you do, and you read a chapter mm -hmm. of it that you know that you need to, whether it's like integrity, you know, whether it's um, your respect whether it's you know being the best version of yourself mm. whether it's um discipline confidence you know whatever you need in that day you know once you've read this book i like to think that you revisit it and you go bang 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 you read a chapter a day right i need to be integral today i need to be honest with myself and therefore you know push push forward and then you read the lesson plant the seeds in your head and away you go but isn't it funny we, you know the bit i did get to in the book before the dog <laughs> got to it is that repetition that practice thing yeah you keep practicing yeah. it and you don't start out I, lo I love the section on goals i thought that was really well laid out yeah. where it's like don't set yourself preposterous goals get from a to b and then you can go from b to c, c that's right because if you look at z you're going to go there's no way i'm yeah. getting there people get carried away with the destination they go right let's just look at mount everest you know from base camp to the summit it's it's, it's an impossible mm -hmm. feat now, if you just think about that you're either not going to commit you're going to get overwhelmed you're going to get anxious you're going to the pressure on you stress mm -hmm. you know etc you know all the things that stop us from committing so you know base camp just think about camp one that's your next well, milestone I mean, regular listeners will mm -hmm. know i've been on my own journey with various things where, whether it's addiction or, or or that kind of stuff and and also, I did used to be, I think, as we were using common parlance, thoroughly overnourished at one point in my life. And, you know, and I had to, uh, over a period of eight months, I took myself. How, how much did you weigh? I, at my heaviest, I was 140 kilos. <laughs> overnourished. You're a fat <laughs> basically. <laughs> yes, I think some people <laughs> did refer to me as a fat <laughs> and uh, yes, I would as well. <laughs> and that thing of, you know, that that kind of thing of the the jolly fat man, I was miserable. Yeah, you played to that right because yeah, but I was miserable. Yeah, you know, there was there was nothing jolly about my life. You Defense know, mechanism, right? Yeah, it's exactly. like, and then you realise that this isn't you. This isn't the person you you're. You're being forced down a down a road or down a or a, into a, a fridge. In, yeah, yeah, or forced into, <laughs> and it, it, that's what I mean about losing yourself, mm. right? And then then you become miserable. Then you know you're you're unhappy. You start to, it starts to affect the people around you. Mm. You know it can lead to catastrophic sort of decisions where you, you don't want to be here anymore. Yes, Depression, absolutely. you know, suicidal thoughts. It's um, that's what happens when you lose yourself, and that's why I always talk about myself just being true to myself even though i know it's it's gonna offend people and i know it's gonna it's not what people want to hear but the moment i lo i'm not going to lose myself for other people mm. for pressure i'm not going to lose myself for the narrative i'm not going to lose myself for things i don't believe in or that that, that aren't true to to my moral compass mm. because the moment you do that it be can become so detrimental to your mental health that it's not worth it well i think it's that thing isn't it we have two imaginations our creative one and our destructive one. Mm -hmm. And the problem is when you fall into that side of thinking, the destructive one's the only one that's got any control. 100%. You know, and you listen to that. And all that does is is, is tell you lies yeah. about yourself. But that's what I say, when you lie to yourself, mm. what do you do? You live a lie. Mm. You know, and a lot of people mm. do that. And the only person that finds you out is yourself. Yeah. Right, because it yeah. comes back around, you go, I'm miserable, I'm unhappy, I need to do something about yeah. this. But I think it is, I've, you know, I've only ever changed anything in my life through the, through the gift of desperation. It hasn't mm. been yeah. because I just had a brief moment of clarity. And oh, I, I appear to mm. be, you know, carrying about 50 kilos more than I should yeah. be. You're I, on the bones of your you ass. Know, it's when, it's when, when you're really on your bones of yeah. your ass, you're getting up in the morning, you stand up, your ankles hurt, your knees hurt, and you go, 
I'm 35 years old. What the hell's going on? Wow. You know. Yeah. So, you know, I'm 54 now. I'm the right weight. Yeah. I, looking good. I, I like looking to keep good. myself as fit as possible. Yeah. But it's very easy for that person to come back. Mm. You know, it's like when you talked about the fact that you've got that beret and it's like, I'm done now. Mm. Don't worry, I've got this. Ah. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, you do. You rest on your laurels, right? Yeah. And then. And so I have to, it is, it is a, for me, it is a daily practice. Mm. And in other words, I'm never the finished article. Yep. I'm practicing every day. I'm learning about myself every day, and I push myself forward. Exposure, every day. exposure, repetition. But there repetition. are days where I don't want to do that. Yep. You strike me as somebody who doesn't have those <laughs> days. <laughs> do you know what? And you, what you spoke about is the epitome of resilience. People mm. think resilience is standing there, you know, with your, chest, with your sword, you know, sword out of the sheath, your shield up, and you're, you're you know, bouncing off. It's not. It's when you're on the bones of your ass, when you are at your final tether, and you decide to make a change. Mm. That's resilience. Mm. So yeah, actually what you're saying is you're sh showing me that you have copious amounts of resilience, psychological resilience, physical resilience, to make that change when you, the easy thing to do is just to give up and just to mm. keep keep on that road. Because that's the easy thing to do, is give in to the destructive, uh, the destructive personality yeah. because it's taking charge of your life and you just go with it. The hard thing to do and the most resilient thing you can do is challenge it. And then, not only challenge it, make a change. Hmm. But uh, what I've also discovered over the years is I can't do that necessarily on my own. Yeah. It's being brave mm -hmm. enough to ask for help. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in whatever way you need to do, to do that, it's like you, know, you were helped by the military to become mm. yep. who you are. You've then gone out and helped, offered help via books mm -hmm. and TV series to change people's mindset. Yeah. Prior to coming on this show, everyone fills out a little questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to take slight truck now with you, Mr. Middleton. Okay. As you just call me a fat <laughs> right? You're not now, but <laughs> if you were 140 kilos at 35, then, you're yeah. Now, oh, <laughs> oh, he's pulled out my favourite crisps. Your favourite crisps are Monster Munch roast oh. beef, which one might argue Come here. are not what... Well, a high performance oh. athlete would eat, is it? Oh, you know what? Normally I get five bags, I get a big bowl, I pour them in the bottom, and I eat them until my jaw seizes up. So, how often do you do that then? Every night? No, no, no. no. <laughs> it would have to be probably about twice a year, three times a year. So no. we, we've we've added, time, a, we've added a fourth one. The last time someone put, um, gave me months and much was when I was uh, at the Logies, which is equivalent to the NTAs yeah. in, in Australia. And I got into my hotel room, and they had twenty, there's twenty packs of Monster Munch, roast beef Monster Munch with a big bowl, and they it just said, well, you know, normally it's a cake with your face yeah. or whatever. They said, and welcome to the star. We know your secrets, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got another secret of yours, which which is, I've got another secret of yours here, which is probably no secret, is you love meat. Oh, and I've got, like that. Jamie the chef has done you his steak and chips there. Oh. Incidentally, Jamie Shears, the head chef here, he was in Seven Para. Yes, the artillery. Yeah. 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 Nice. So, a military man has cooked that for you. It's good, isn't it? Oh, my God. So, what percentage of your daily diet consists of meat? A lot of it. I hit a carnival diet. I could call it a diet. It's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. But meat is yeah, it's my go-to meal. Mm. Whether it's lamb... Chicken, steak, um, any duck. I love a bit you know, of duck. I had some duck yesterday. Underrated but, duck. Yeah, it is. But um, this is uh, this is what I go to. Yeah. But if if you're say for example you are being uh, about to be splashed across the front page of Men's mm. Health, mm -hmm. do you go on some kind of stripping diet or are you just? I mean, I'm not asking you to take your top off now, let's be clear. <laughs> but are you ready to go at yeah. all points? You never you, know you never fall below a certain 
level. I don't believe in diets. I, um, no. If if you're in a bad place with your with you know with your body, and you know you're not taking on the correct nutrition, then a diet is great to break to break a habit. Mm. But then you know that diet should go into a lifestyle. That's what people don't realise. You know, it's really really important that it goes into a lifestyle. It should become part of your practice. It's yeah exactly. So the diet is you know, and again you talk about goals. The diet is just the first first way of breaking the mold and once you've broken that mold you know you've got you got you've got to you've got to continue it because mm. otherwise as you know you just fluctuate people die and they go oh I look great for the some mm. holiday and then all of a sudden and that inconsistency with your well, body that's more, I think bad. that's that's more dangerous from your body for yeah. your body than being consistently slightly <laughs> overweight I yeah. think that fluctuation your your organs never know quite where they are or what they're supposed to be doing Exactly, and the nutrients and minerals that your body bodies that your body needs is all in all in food. All in food. Now listen, don't overeat there because we've got to that point in proceedings where I'm going to do to you what you have done to many people over the years. I'm not going to interrogate you, but I am going to blindfold you. Let's go. I've got your rather fetching uh, leopard print one here from our friends at Smug. Um, are you, you, you're obviously secure enough in yourself to wear leopard print, which is... Uh, I thought it was a bra. <laughs> <laughs> so you pop the blindfold on, and I am going to slide in your first spoon. I, I'm taking the steak away, and you can have it back afterwards, Please. right? But I'm going to slide in... So here is your first... Spoon, and I'm going to feed it to you. Okay. Put that cloche down there. So, as they say, here comes the train. Now, talk to me about textures, flavours, what you're getting there. Any prime flavour jumping out for Mushroom. you? Mushroom. Exactly. Mushroom um, risotto. Oh my God, this man! This man has a, an exceptional palate. Take take the blindfold off. So we put that together because. Part of what you talked about, that's a wild mushroom risotto, because part of what you talked about was a love of foraging and Absolutely. actually going out into nature and finding your food where it should naturally come from. Yep. Wow. Oh, can I have that one? Yeah, yeah, they're both yours. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, who taught you how to do that? Because you can, if you get that wrong, mm -hmm. that's, that's a dangerous space. You know, I mean, I've heard stories of people going, I, I picked some mushrooms and the whole family ending up on, on yeah, dialysis yeah, exactly. through kidney Six failure. Feet under. Yeah. I learned from my older brother, the eldest of uh, amongst the four. Um, and we learned from France, really. When we used to go out in France, um, we, that's, that was our playground. Our playground were the fields, was the forest. Um, and, you know, where the local farmers all, all surrounded us. We lived in a sort of like, you know, in a sort of farming community. So what was really cool about it is um, the farmers would just, you know, you'd see a farmer in a field and you think they'd be shouting at you, they'd, you know, come on over. and it's, it's They the, would here. Yeah, I know. Get yeah, off yeah. my land! <laughs> they'd get a salt gun. Well, they were, you know, they loved, they loved to take us in the tractors and, and again, yeah, just out and cut it off. And they'd explain what, you know, the way that you peel it is also, uh, also how, you, how you identify if it's a good one or not. And over the year, you know, you really just you don't go out to learn it, mm. but you just pick it up. So you know, and it wasn't until you know my oldest brother used to be in the field. He'd go, oh, you know, didn't have much to eat. Well, we just, I, I mean, I live in the middle of a wood, mm -hmm. and we are we're just coming out of the end of mushroom season yep. there, and we get huge chicken of the woods yeah, and stuff exactly. like that. And we we slice that up, and 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 you can freeze it quite well, so you can save it for later. And on you can the pickle year. them, and yeah. you know you can do you can I do multiple things with them. So um, and also they're very they're very good for you as well. They're very good yeah. for your immune system, and and actually mushrooms are very good for you, for your love handles as well. Are they? Mm. Is it the purine? It's the yeah, purine right. in yes, a mushroom, it. isn't yeah. it? That mm -hmm. that will that will you go. You know your mushrooms. That, that will that will manage your as you age your estrogen levels as a man, there so you, you don't get. That bit, uh, your muffin tops. See, there you go. <laughs> see, look, we're synced. Hey, eh? you know. You see, well, I was I was lucky enough to learn all of that off the great Gennaro Contaldo, who's oh, yeah. the you know one of the 
uh, two greedy Italians and a sort of. I have no idea who they are, but. Right. No. So he was Jamie Oliver's me great mentor. Oh, and okay. And he was the first guy that I ever worked for, and he was all about wild mushrooms. And I worked in this kitchen, and these strange figures would turn up in the morning with sort of trugs of stuff that they'd been out since 3 a.m. picking, and then we'd prep them all. But the problem was, you'd get your black. Your f tips of your fingers yep. would be black for weeks on end from sort of, yep. you know, cleaning the mushrooms up. That's right. Or in your nails. Yep. It always looked like you're a dirty yeah. boy. Yeah. Lemons. Yep. Lemons there get rid of that. Yep. It's time for you to pop that back on again because it's second gone. spoon time, and Here we go with the second and final spoon. Have we got something here for you, Mr. Middleton? Open wide again. And again, textures, flavours, what have you got? Ah, tofu. <laughs> My God, this man has a, you have a very clear palate. I can tell oh. by the texture only. <laughs> right away, then the tasteless, it's tasteless. It's, um, <laughs> it's, def it's a texture. Go on, take it off. I mean, we tried to hide it. It's I mean, we deep fried it and we did a lovely Japanese dressing with that. It's still tasteless. And once you get past that initial, I don't know what it is with tofu. I don't. I mean, I don't. Love I don't. It. I don't. I don't not like it, but it would be the least. It would be right at the bottom of my pile of, of, of food. And I, I, I like all food. I, I, like, I like to try everything. My, my palate's quite. Um, but you've got, actually got a really good palate because you'd be amazed the amount of people who come on. Mm -hmm. including top chefs mm -hmm. who don't recognize certain foods and like with a risotto to know that that was a risotto to know yeah. that it was mushrooms yeah to spot that that was tofu straight away that's because of the texture of it yeah. right, directly yeah. and again you did hide it so crunched into it and, and and tofu's not crunchy as you know i crunched and i was like mm. and then i started like straight away I, I went like that pushed it down onto my palate onto my tongue and the texture of it straight away Tofu. Well, you you continue to impress, Mr. <laughs> Middleton, and I wish you every success with this book. I've now got an uneaten copy, <laughs> so I'm going to take it home and finish it. It's all yours, mate. All but yours. Uh, and hopefully you will sign it for me as well. Absolutely. Ant's book, Military Mindset, is out to buy now. The first thirty pages I can highly recommend. I look forward to the rest of them when I get home, but it is a great book full of great information. And uh, I would like to say thank you to Ant for donning the uh, fetching leopard print blindfold and also showing that he's actually got a really good palette. That is all for this week on Spooning with me, Mark Wogan. Thank you to the team here at the Mount Street Restaurant as ever. And I will be back next week with another guest who I will be blindfolding. And this podcast is available where ever you get your podcast from and on the Virgin YouTube channel. So take a look. Until then, stay beautiful. <laughs>